You know, there's nothing like cracking that, that cellophane and pulling that record out. It just smells great. Welcome to Buzz Mayhem Hour. Non-stop hardcore energy. I love the show, guys. You're awesome. Yeah. Unlike any other. With your host, John the Bud, a.k.a. The Bodfather. Man, this stuff rocks. What is up, everybody? This is Ralph Sutton. You know me from the SDR Show and the Good Sugar Podcast. Right now, you're listening to my boy. It's Bob's Mayhem Hour. The views and opinions of the guest do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of Bob's Mayhem Radio Network, its staff, affiliates, or sponsors. Parental discretion is advised. Welcome to Bob's Mayhem Radio Network. Hey everybody, welcome to Bod's Mayhem Hour. I'm your host, John the Bod, a.k.a. The Bod Father. And as always, I'm bringing you guys and gals awesome interviews. And today, it's an honor and a huge privilege to welcome Mr. Ralph Sutton. He is the founder of Gas Digital Network, host of the DSR Show and Good Sugar Podcasts. Also, he's an author of the 100% Guaranteed Guide to Weight Loss and Fitness, you know, podcasting, also rock music. He's done food and wellness expert. Also had a syndicated radio show called The Tour Bus for years. And uh, he also handled the syndication personally by going to station to station. And that's how you used to do it, folks, back in the day to get somebody to listen to you. So, Ralph, welcome to the show, man, and uh, glad to have you on here. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. Uh, I was just listening to your episode with the dude from Beatallica uh, recently, so uh, it's cool to be on. Um, and it's funny, that used to be the case. I used to have to drive around with CDs in my car to try and get radio stations to give us five minutes of their time mm-hmm. to listen and see. And we got up to about 100 stations on my old radio show. And to this day, which is crazy, is we've been off the air six years, but I still will get people hitting me up asking me like apparently there's a community of people that share cds of my old radio show and trade them online which is crazy i just can't believe that that happens but it's very cool i'm actually looking to dig up my old hard drives to give some of these people uh all the episodes that is awesome right there folks is is what you call doing it yourself and I'm, I don't mean that arrogantly or anything like that. It's just what you have to do. And being a podcaster is the same way. And being getting into the radio station, stuff like that at the beginning, it puts you in mind of, of like a band because you're going place to place to say, hey, listen to this. Just like bands used to, man. So you did it year or seven just like bands used to. Yeah, but, you know, I would say that um, today it's sort of the same thing in that, the only difference is you're not leaving your home. You're doing sure. everything yourself, but you're setting up a, whether it's a, a TikTok page or an Instagram page or your RSS feed or your website. The cool news now is that it allows everybody almost like an equal playing field to do this. Whereas when I had my syndicated radio show, if we weren't on at least one station where we had a following, you couldn't be on any other station. You know what I mean? So Mm -hmm. there was a barrier to entry that doesn't exist anymore, which I find fascinating. The idea that anybody could do pretty much anything is amazing to me. Like even you, you brought up my book. I had a silly idea for a book, which started when we, I did this podcast called I've been doing for about a year called good sugar. And it's with the guy that started a very successful raw vegan juice company here in New York called Juice Press. They have about 90 locations. And we just started doing the show for the idea of to try and get me healthy again. I had gained a lot of weight. I was a little depressed when my father passed away and gained about 60, 70 pounds and went to be over 300 pounds, which for me was the most I'd ever weighed in my life. Mm -hmm. And we just started focusing on me getting better. And that was the idea behind the podcast. And I've lost Uh, I think now it's like almost 60 pounds since we started doing this and I still have a little bit more to go, but that's fine. But my joke was, and I kept saying it on the show as a joke that we bring in all these health and wellness experts, but it really boils down to two things, eat less and work out more. You know, you could write every, every uh, guide in the world, but it really is if you eat less and work out more for most of us, we're going to get into a much better space 
physically and mentally, right? So my book is 200 pages, but there's only four words written. Page one says eat less, page two says work out more, and the rest of it's blank. And it went to 77 on Amazon, and I stand by it. I give you your money back. If you can show me that you're doing that and you're not losing weight, I will give you your money back. <laughs> and condolences of your father passing. Mine, mine passed away as well, and I did the same thing. I went into a dark place. So, yeah, it it, affect, it, it affects everybody differently. But, uh, yeah, I want to step back here for just a few moments, Ralph, if you don't mind. How, how, shocked, sure. how shocked are you, though, that people are – Wanting to get a hold of your old syndicate radio stuff, man. I mean, you know, how, what's that? What goes through your mind when you hear that? Yeah, that really blew my my mind. I knew years ago when the show was live, when it was still existing, that people would share the CDs. That was on. I don't know if they still exist, but there was a a, a thing that sh- the way to share media was called torrents. Mm-hmm. I think it was called BitTorrent. I don't know if it still exists, but we're going back like ten years. And I saw once on a couple of torrent sites people sharing episodes of my show. And I thought, well, that's really cool. I mean, it made no difference to me financially. So I didn't care, you know, share it, share it all you like. And I've always felt with rock and roll music, the more you can get it out there, the better. So I just was happy it was being shared. But what happened was I was on Twitter and someone sent me a DM that wasn't, uh, it was following me, but I wasn't following them. And I looked at their um, profile and their background picture of their Twitter page was a call sheet from my old radio show. Like they actually had a screenshot of the actual page from my like guide sheet that would get mailed out with my CDs back in the day. Mm -hmm. And I hit him up. I'm like, how the hell did you get that? Did you, were you a a board op at one of the shows? He goes, no, no, no. There's a community of us that we should, we share these shows where we could find them. And I couldn't believe it. I was so happy. I, I dug up every old, like little tour bus memorabilia I had, like I had a lighter and an old t-shirt that was like never get, never worn. And I just sent the dude a bunch of shit because I was so thrilled that they were doing that. So it just makes me happy to know it exists. I worked. That was how I identified myself from 29 to 44. I was Ralph from the tour bus and I didn't know any other lifestyle that I lived and breathed that radio show. See folks, that's me right there. I live and breathe Bod's mayhem, our podcast. If I could just affect one person who digs one band that I have on here, kudos i'm doing my job so yeah exactly i mean that's how i feel i mean i really always believed in all you got to do is if you're reaching people everything mm-hmm. else will, will follow you know if, if people like what you're saying and like what you're doing everything else will follow you know that old theory I, as, as hacky as it sounds but i believe it if you love what you do you don't work a day in your life and, I, and it, you're not going to put in the extra hours you're not going to put in the you know, wake up at five in the morning to do something because you have to, it's because you want to, you know, and that's what makes the biggest difference. And thank you for listening to my podcast of Metallica. I appreciate that. Thank you so much, man. No worries. I I always believe in doing the due diligence and anybody that's going to be doing the uh, honor of having me on, I could show them the respect of doing a little, you know, listening and making sure that, uh, you know, I understand where, where I'm going. It doesn't always work if I have like a bunch of stuff to do in a week, but I try the most I can to listen to a little bit of everybody that uh, I'm going to be on. So I want to talk about the uh, Gas Digital Network. How hard did the pandemic affect you guys, or did you guys just actually just start doing it from your actual homes? Well, the crazy thing is this. So uh, my podcast started about six years ago, the SDR show, and then about a year and a half or two years after that, we started Gas Digital, which was about now about four and a half years ago, five years ago. Mm -hmm. And the pandemic started, and in the beginning, you know, everybody kind of thought it was a joke. No one knew how serious to take it or what was going on. Here in New York, it was the the few days before St. Patrick's Day, they announced that uh, the city's closing down that Monday. So it was like a Thursday, and they said on Monday that the, you're not going to be allowed to go to your offices anymore. So we, we had a group Slack channel you know, where all of our producers and, and hosts and everything can communicate through. And I said, all right, we got to figure this out. So all the producers have to meet me at the studios and we got to figure this out. And we called all the shows at the time. I think we had 18 shows on the network. Now we have about 22, but um, we figured out who has what at their house. Do you have a, do you have a camera? Do you have a microphone? Do you have a computer? Whatever you need. And we were literally unscrewing things in the studios <laughs> and sending out things to people that needed them. You know, I had a couple extra cameras at my house. We had a couple extra mics at this place. And then we sent out, uh, you know, uh, Ubers in various directions. And by the end of the day, Friday leading into that weekend, 
we knew every single show was not going to miss a beat. And that was the most important thing. Then we had to decide, well, what are we going to do? You know, how are we handling this? Because we lost every single advertiser because nobody was open. Nobody was making money. Um, our biggest advertiser at the time was a, uh, a legal, legal sports betting company, but there was no sports to bet on. So they stopped bet, you know, stopped thing, doing anything with us. And understandably, in a lot of places couldn't even ship. So why, why are they advertising? You know, so we, instead of, we went the other direction, which was kind of weird. I told my business partner, we kind of mutually agreed on this. If we're going to go down, let's go down in a ball of flames. So instead of, you know, downsizing, we didn't fire anybody. We raised our prices, but what we did was we gave a code. Anybody that signed up got, two, I think it was two months free to just try out the network. So we know everyone's home. Just take it. You can get free for two months and try it out. And um, we added two shows. We just went balls out and it ended up really working for us. We, we doubled our subscription numbers. And then once the ad sales started coming back, we did not lose any subscribers. We just kept going up and up and up. And now we have, you know, more subscribers than ever. And thankfully that it feels like we're maybe on the other side of this. Uh, all the advertising starts to come, started to come back too. Yeah. And I hate to say this, but I, I hate that we all had to go through COVID, but as far as you guys work from home and everything like, do you see that this has been more helpful to you guys that are people listening to more podcasting now since the pandemic and everything? I would say this. Uh, the good news for us is that we are all video shows, right? So mm -hmm. we're video and audio. The truth is audio listening went down a lot for everybody, Spotify, everybody, because audio was most listened to, whether it's podcasting, Spotify, Pandora, whatever, to and from work on commutes. And audio wasn't happening. You know, audio went down across the board for us 30 to 40 percent. But we made up for that from the video side more than that. So that's what made it work was that the good news for us was all the major networks. If you go back and remember, there was like even like the Tonight Show and all these shows, they were in reruns in the beginning. And then they started with Zoom. And we already had experience with doing this because, you know, you, you Zoom in guests all the time or whatever. So we already were uh, ahead of the game. It was just a matter of getting the people that didn't have uh, stuff at home and plus my home studio, I was always using anyway to get guess it will start in my home studio. So we looked and sounded better than major networks in the beginning, which was crazy. Like I couldn't believe we were like delivering better quality content than NBC. It, it blew my mind. Mm -hmm. Right. So everybody started gravitating towards the video podcast that have been doing it for a while. Cause it just looked and sounded so much better. So that part really helped us. Uh, cause we had a video element to our shows, but I know most podcasts and our network as well, the audio went down a lot. Now it's, it's, it's back. But during that year, the audio side of it went down for sure. Yeah. And I'm starting to do video now. And then people's been hounding me over, like, put your face with the brand, put your face with the brand. I'm like, I'm, I'm trying. <laughs> it's not easy. Yeah, and also the truth is this, sorry to cut you off, but you just want to be where everyone's looking, you know? Yeah. So the number two biggest search engine on the planet is YouTube. But if you just put up audio on YouTube, people get pissed. Because like, hey, I'm here to watch something. Don't make me listen. Yeah. I want to watch. So you just need to be where people are looking. So that's why, like, our podcast should be, like, I hear people saying, hey, should I do Spotify only? Because they're offering better advertising rates. And I'm like, why? You're mm -hmm. now telling people in this world of a million podcasts, hey, not only do I want you to listen to me besides the other 999,999 podcasts, but I want you to listen to me only on Spotify. So maybe you don't use Spotify. So now I'm never going to hear you like, in, or are you asking me to change platforms solely for your podcast? Unless you're Joe Rogan, that doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm up to almost, honestly, I'm not joking when I say this, I've been doing this for 11 years and I've got almost 4,000 interviews. But I mean, if you look at my YouTube page, I'm late getting to the YouTube game and I'm behind. I've got 900 and something on there right now, but they're all audio. It's like you said, Put the face with the brand because that's what people want to see. They want to see a video, right. and that's what I'm doing. Yeah. But, hey, I'm still giving it hell. I'm not going to give up on this. I love doing this. Yeah, I learned the hard way. Like when we first started SDR, the the um, podcast hosting network I was using, uh, Libsyn, which I always recommend. I think they're a great uh, hosting place. Um had a, like a one click to send to YouTube. So it would just take your artwork and put in the audio and just auto send it to YouTube. So you didn't have to do anything when you published your podcast. Yes. It went, you know, links go to iTunes and everywhere else, 
but I just automatically went to YouTube and I said, oh, this is great. I'm going to do that. And all I got was hate. Why are you putting this up as audio? I don't want to listen. Send me, where's the video? And I'm like, oh, I get it. You know, it's just like you have to learn each platform. Like Twitter is better for words. Instagram is better for pictures. TikTok is better for video. You have to under, understand the platform you're on because those people are there for those reasons. Yeah, for sure. Now, doing this all from home during this pandemic and everything, did you find yourself loving this more, you know, doing the interviews? And plus, did, did it renew your fire possibly? Did it add more, I guess, fire to you uh, doing all this now? Well, I actually will always prefer an in-person interview, right? Because mm -hmm. there's just something about body language, something about like, you know, you get to bullshit a little bit before you go live. Maybe you have a drink. You're talking a little bit before you go in the studio. That part usually will relax a guest a little bit, that five, 10 minutes before you start, right? Plus, for a lot of people, the professional look of a studio makes them feel like uh, a little more important as well, which I like, you know? And there's just something about that direct eye-to-eye -eye contact that will, no matter how good a Zoom call is, it's never gonna. It's never gonna be the same, sure. right? So, I and also what's crazy now that we're back to almost pre-pandemic uh, ratios, ninety something percent of my audience is audio, right? So it's much less video, and yet people would complain. I can tell you're not in studio. I want you back in studio, right? And I agree. I understand it. There is that half second of disconnect when it's through video, when it's on the phone. There's just, and it's just an unavoidable truth. On the flip side, it was amazing to be able to get guests that we normally would never have had on the show because we were doing it, hey, we're all home all the time, so whenever you're free, I'm free. So we had Ray Romano on, we had Neil deGrasse Tyson on, we had all these crazy guests that I was like, how the fuck did we get these guests? <laughs> but it's because everybody's home, you mm -hmm. know? So it was great to have episodes that we probably would have never been able to achieve, but I wish, I wish I could go back in time and get every single one of those in studio because they would have been better interviews. Oh, sure. Yeah. You got caught hacking on computer system at a young age that led you that. Yeah, that's funny. Yes. That's, that's funny. I wonder uh, who told you that, but yes, that is true. Um, so when I was, I had a very odd upbringing. I grew up in Brooklyn, New York. Mm -hmm. And um, when I was 14, I was very into, Break dancing, which is hilarious because I, if you ever see a picture of me now, I'm a six foot five, very obviously white dude, uh, does not look like someone that is uh, the epitome of athleticism. But when I was 14, I was very into break dancing, got quite good, and was actually in a break dancing movie and would go battle kids and in, in uh, like roller rinks like Club USA and all these other things. It was a big thing to do in Brooklyn, right? But then at some point, I pivoted a 180, couldn't be any further from that. I felt somehow at like 15 computers are our future. Like I think I saw war games and I was like, this is where we're at. And I started taking typing classes, which were, you know, I'm 51. So in 1984, 1985, I was the only dude in a typing class. Cause at the time it was a, it was a class for women that wanted to be secretaries. It was not for guys that wanted to learn how to type for computers, but mm -hmm. I just believed that it was going to be popular. And then I started getting, involved with fascinated by a modem and connecting to um bulletin boards and which before the internet they were bu called bulletin boards uh and all these things that i would find out how to do things like change a grade through my high school you know connecting to the server or changing my phone num my phone bill or changing my electric bill <laughs> or doing dumb shit you know and at the time it was the wild west because there wasn't a lot of security. There wasn't a lot of, no, it was so new. So it wasn't the levels of security that you have now. It was like, basically, if you found out the password, you could log in. It was really, it was ridiculous. You know, and you could, the term brute force attack, where if you knew it was a five digit or five alphanumeric password, it wasn't that hard to figure out. You could just keep trying. You know what I mean? It was crazy. So you try overnight and eventually you get on and, I always feel this is an important uh, distinction. My brother, I have a twin brother and I, and we also used to crack video games and stuff and release them online and for other people to download. How stupid we were, our big cracking illegal name for our group of 
games that we would put out. We called ourselves the Sutton Brothers, which is our real last name. Like, how stupid are you that you're not even trying to hide your identity? Right? This is how stupid we were. But um, <laughs> we actually didn't get caught. What happened was somebody else got caught, and they said to the FBI, oh, you really want somebody. You should go after these kids. And they gave my brother and I's address and phone number and documentation to show how screwed up we were and what we were doing. So I answered the door when the doorbell rang a few months later. Can we speak to the parents of Ralph and Joe Sutton? And the FBI bed, like you see in a movie, was right at the door, right in the window. And I called my mother over and we didn't let them in because they didn't have a search warrant. But we had to go get a lawyer. We had to do all this stuff. And at one point they were talking about a couple of years in jail, a couple hundred thousand dollar fine, but we were underaged. My dad got a good lawyer. We got off on some sort of stupid technicality and thank God I didn't have to do anything. Oh, wow. Jeez. Very lucky, sir. <laughs> Very yeah, lucky. no, uh, no shit. I'm super, super lucky. And then, you know, I, I still am love computers. Like I, the first gas digital computers, I built them all. It's cheaper. You know, you save 30%. Oh yeah. And, um, I figured out, like, I remember I was told when we first built our studios, oh, if you want to do this, going back like six, five, six years ago, if you want to build a multi-camera HD studio with a live switch, you have to get a TriCaster, and a TriCaster is $10,000 and blah, blah, blah. You're not going to do it for no, less than a quarter of a million dollars to make it. And I was like, you know, that can't be true. That's the archaic way of looking at this. And I found a card that plugs into a PC online that was only available in China. It was $600. The instructions came in Chinese, but I used Google Translate, Image Translate, to figure out how to get it set up on my computer, and we saved $10,000 by doing it that way. <laughs> That's what I do, man. I'm in technical support with the Internet and stuff, so I'm interested in it, but I've been doing it for a very, very long time. <laughs> right, I hear you. But it's a, it's a how when you go to the school of Google and YouTube, yeah, uh, yeah. you can really figure out the answers to almost anything. <laughs> like, you're not the first one to have your problem. Whatever your problem is, there's not only another person about it, there's probably a several blogs and websites dedicated to that problem, oh, yeah. and you'll get it fixed. Oh, yeah, definitely. Google is, is your resource. If Google can't fix it, then just give it a couple months. Somebody will eventually have yeah. the same problem. <laughs> yeah, and there'll be a step-by-step -step guide on YouTube yep. showing you how to f fix your problem. Very rarely, like right now, we, we started doing, um, which I'm always trying to be, a little ahead of the curve. I did, started it a few years ago, but it wasn't working right. And I figured it just wasn't ready, which is streaming live 360 podcast to uh, quests and stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. But the problem was at the time it could only do 10 minutes and now it could do uh, the whole show, but, and they know this at uh, the company that makes the 360 cameras, their newest update crippled the audio. So you can't live stream with live audio right now. So that it's just directly from the camera manufacturer, unless you want to spend five grand on a high end camera, which I'm not going to do. Um, you can't stream uh, that right now. So I'm waiting for the next update, but I just always try to be one step ahead of everybody. We were the first network to have an Amazon uh, Alexa, you know, um, app for our network. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm, I'm always trying to do things that keep things a step ahead. Now, I know that you've interviewed a lot of bands and a lot of uh, uh, actors and actresses, movie stars, stuff like that. But any bands or artists you interviewed that left you kind of starstruck or made you a little bit nervous, possibly? For sure. I mean, I still, to this day, always get excited when somebody's coming on the show that I really want to talk to. You know, earlier uh, I, I talked with Josh Todd, who from Buck Cherry, that I've probably interviewed 10 times over the years, but I just think he's such an awesome dude that I always get excited to talk to him. Um, but for sure, I would say the most starstruck for sure was Ozzy, you know, to be standing next to Ozzy seemed surreal to me. You know, it's just, I mean, I'm standing next to the, a true living legend. It, it, it was hard to believe. I had met a lot of others over the years, all these, you know, legendary people, you know, even before that I had interviewed all of black Sabbath, when they went out as heaven and hell with Ronnie James Dio. So I was in a room with geezer and, and the whole, the whole crew, you know, mm -hmm. but, um, and Tony and it was geezer, Tony it was all for them, you know, but whatever, but, um, something about it being actually Ozzy was hard to believe, you know, like, and I was just in a room with him that, that was 
definitely starstruck. When I had Neil deGrasse Tyson on this year, which, you know, is not very rock and roll, but I've been a fan of his for 15 years, ever since they downplayed, um, downgraded Pluto from a planet to a micro planet. Mm -hmm. I just thought he was so funny about how he handled that. And I've been following his career and saw him speak at um, the uh, Hayden Planetarium during the Isaac Asimov debates and read several of his books. I just wanted to not screw that one up. You know, like I'm so excited to have this genius on. I wanted to make sure that uh, I got everything right. So that was like I did my probably more prep work for Neil deGrasse Tyson than I've ever done for anybody. But I was so proud of my first two questions, which the first question was telling him how much I loved him and followed his career. And I said, uh, and excuse my me cursing here, but I said, why the fuck would you come on a show called Sex, Drugs, and Rock and Roll? <laughs> <laughs> I get so excited to interview everybody, I, including yourself, man. I, I feel like, you know, we're podcasters, you know, we do the same thing. And it's it's cool to have somebody on here like yourself to talk about this stuff that we go through. You know, it's it's I love this. Um, any other bands and stuff, man, I get excited, even local bands. How can you know, for me personally, how can you not get excited for anybody that you interview? You know what I mean? It's, yeah. It's, it's, yeah what, what I like. What I really excites me is when I'm bringing someone on that maybe I don't know a lot about, mm -hmm. right? So I, I've always been, um, I, I go do crazy research. I'll, I'll spend, you know, three, four, sometimes days researching people, you know, to make sure I know. And I always I say one of the tricks I love to do is watch interviews from when they first started and then watch interviews to them now to see how maybe their perspective has changed on things and how mm -hmm. they react to things differently. I find it fascinating, you know, yeah, yeah. and uh, to get a real understanding of the person. But sometimes you go into it not knowing much. And by the end, you're like, holy crap, this guy is so interesting. Like so many wild things that you don't know because, you know, you might be a fan of a band or fan or, or fan of a song that did or fan of an actor. But when you look into their life, you learn so much. You're like, oh my God, I, I have 80 things to talk about this guy to talk about with this guy that is not even related to what I thought we were going to talk about. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. And, and the interviews, man, they just go in their own way. I mean, you have certain questions you want to ask and the way you want to go, but if it goes that one way and it's smooth, let it go. <laughs> Throw the questions out. Oh you know, yeah. You know, just fly on the wall, let it go. <laughs> that has been my biggest, you know, I get a lot of um, people that ask for advice, which I, I appreciate that they would come out to me and ask for that. And mm -hmm. for a while I was helping, um, CBS radio a few years ago launched their podcast division and they hired me to like oversee and work with a few of their like reality stars and people to help them launch their podcasts and whatnot. And the number one thing I would always tell people is, yeah, do your prep work. I don't ever really particularly like write questions. I'll write like bullet points that I know I want to bring up. Um, but I, you know, whatever works for anybody, if they want to do questions or whatever. But um, what I always say is, if a guy wants, if a guest wants to take you in a certain direction, go with it. Yep. Don't wait to ask your next question, mm -hmm. which is the worst thing you can do. You're like, you're not even listening to the answer. You're just waiting to ask the next question, which is the worst way to do an interview. And I remember listening to this other rock guy years ago. And it's funny. It brings up, uh, cause I just interviewed Josh Todd is what they came on my mind. Um, and I don't want to say, I don't want to shit on anybody specifically, but, he opened the interview, introduced him, and Josh made a very funny joke about the um, podcaster's name, but like in a sexual way. Mm -hmm. right? Like We're showing that he wants to play around on the interview. He wants to be fun. Yeah, yeah. And the guy's response was, yeah, so tell me about the new album. <laughs> I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> the guy's asking to play around with you, and that's what you give him back? <laughs> Oh, well, maybe the guy was just so nervous. You know what I mean? No, no, he's, I don't, I don't want to say who he is, but he's a very well-known uh, guy in this industry. Okay. And I just, it, it boggles my mind that things like that happen, you know? Oh my God. I'd love to have Josh Todd on my podcast. Not yet, but I will not give it up. I've had he's a, lot a super, of, you know, it's a super likable dude. Super nice guy. Yeah. I've had a lot of people on here and I'm very fortunate. That's for sure. That is for sure. So yeah, I saw you had Henry Rollins on a few years ago. That's cool as shit. Yes, sir, I did. And and, and the reason I love his music, don't, don't get me wrong, but what fascinates me the most about Henry is his love for historical stuff. Uh, that, I, yeah. I, I love that. 
I, I love everything about historical things, Civil War, all that stuff. I eat it up. And um, yeah, he was telling me about he was at theater where John Wilkes Booth was the night that, of course, he said, oh, wow. Uh, President Lincoln. Yeah. Yeah. He was there. That's pretty wild. You know, it's funny to, to make it uh, all tie in full circle. Uh, Josh Todd and Henry Rollins were together in the movie, the new guy. Oh, wow. There you go. There you go. That's awesome. <laughs> like I said, hopefully I'll get Josh on here one day, but you know, we'll see. Hopefully, hopefully. So you have sex, drugs and rock and roll, of course, and it's hosted by yourself and big J Okerson. I want to ask this, how is working with him and what has he added to this? podcast with you guys and your show did did he add something that was possibly missing and and when do you both know how far to push the boundaries ralph that's the key question that's funny so um it's you know we, we started together the show uh i think it's six years ago I, I keep screwing up the date but it's like six years ago roughly and um you know we during the pandemic i went to two times a week understanding that his schedule would not allow it so he does one of them a week with me, and then I have a few other comics that will fill in when Jay is not around, and we bring that in, uh, bring them in to, to co-host. Uh, and, you know, Jay's schedule, Jay's gotten much, much bigger over the past few years to where, you know, he's got another podcast that's twice a week, on sorry, once a week, but he also has his radio show that's four times a week. Um, so his schedule has is, is definitely gotten crazier. And the funny thing is that Jay really is there, you know, we look, we're, He's one of my favorite people in the world. Let's start with that. I love him. But he is also the funniest guy I've ever met in my life. And if you don't know his comedy, by all means, look at him up. He's on Netflix. They have the, a series called The Degenerates, and his episode is the first one. And uh, if you don't like that, you're just not going to be a fan of his comedy or, or probably our podcast. <laughs> but um, his job is to just, you know, he likes to push buttons, and he likes to see how far we can go. But he's also... The most like he's also a very sensitive guy to where if he feels that the person doesn't want to play along, he will shut down pretty quickly with it, you know, but because of him, things always get a little further than they would because he he'll ask the questions that we're all thinking, but something about his boyish charm gets him to get away with it, you know, but sometimes it goes awry and sometimes it doesn't, but that's what makes the show great. You know, to me, I believe there should never be any limits. Like if you're coming on a show called sex, drugs, and rock and roll, you know what you're getting into. Don't do the show. If you think <laughs> you're going to get offended easily, Yeah. you know, and we've had a, we've had a couple of big times over the years where people got upset and it was crazy. One of them, I'm not going to mention the band, but we never aired it because they got so offended. They came to us. They said they were big fans of the show and they would love to be on. Then they got offended by a couple of jokes, even though they were laughing the whole time and they were playing along and making the same jokes. <laughs> the next day, their publicist reached out to us and asked us not to air it. So we're not assholes. We said, fine, we won't air it. And that was the end of it. But to me, like you came to us and the show's called Sex, Drugs, and Rock. What, what did you think was going to happen? Yeah. It's not like a, you know, Mary Poppins show. <laughs> Right. And then we had another guy, which is weird. We always end the show uh, by asking what I call the first, your first experience with sex, drugs, and rock and roll. First time you had sex, first drug you ever did, first concert you ever went to. Right. And we've asked everybody that for the last six years, never missed an episode. Right. Um, this one guy was going to come on. He's a very famous singer, guitarist, and his public says he'll come on, but he doesn't want to answer the first question. And I said, that's fine, but I have to ask it. And then he could say he prefers not to answer. We won't push him, but I just have to ask it. He goes, well, he prefers that you don't ask it. <laughs> I'm like, well, then I'm going to look like the, the lunatic because we've never not asked it. Just like I could say this story when I was doing my old radio show. We, this happened twice with me, and I'll, I'll say who these are. It was Richie Blackmore, and it was Axl Rose. Oh, right? wow. wow. And both of you did not, and this is not for sex, drugs, and rock and roll. This is on my old radio show. Mm -hmm. So this was when Ricky Blackmore put out his new solo record. And when Axl Rose put out the uh, first single of uh, Chinese democracy, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. We were offered interviews and they both said the same thing. Their publicists, you can't ask about the old band. You can't ask about anything to do with anything, but 
just this new song. So I thought I would look like a lunatic. How do you bring on Richie Blackmore and not bring up Deep Purple or Rainbow? Right. Yeah. That would be bizarre. Then they would think the interviewer is an idiot. Right. Yeah. And the same thing with with with, with uh, Axel. It was right at the time when like Velvet Revolver hit and all this other stuff. How do you not bring up anything to do with Guns N' Roses except your one song? Oh my God! You know, yeah. Yeah. I'm like, how am I going to talk about that for ten minutes? Right. What do I do? You know, like, you know. So I just on both of those, and they both asked for it to be pre-recorded because this is on the radio show, and then they could decide afterwards if we were going to air it. Oh my and on God. both of those instances, and I can say this, I can't prove that this came from Axel or Richie, but it was their publicist that asked, right? Right. So I can't blame them directly. Who knows? Maybe they were there oblivious to this, which happens a lot. You know, you never know. But I declined both interviews because I felt like, well, that's not going to be good. And it's going to make me look like I have a mental disorder. You bring on Richie Blackmore, you don't bring up his two most famous bands of all time. What's wrong with you? Right. That's like bringing Ozzy on your show and don't talk anything about Black Sabbath and how they're the forefathers of metal. You know what I'm saying? It's like, hey, Ozzy. Right. It's crazy. <laughs> oh, my God. It's crazy. Yeah. So yeah. I had I had it. Those are the only two times that I declined an interview from somebody I really wanted to talk to wow. because it's like, well, that's not going to be fun. There's no way that's going to be fun. Yeah. Jeez, man. That, you know. I mean, that's happened a lot. You're not the only one. Yeah. When I first started the, the radio show, we couldn't get interviews from anybody because, you know, we were in the small station in the middle of nowhere, New Jersey, from 10 to midnight on a Sunday. We couldn't pre-record interviews, so that was it. So what I did was I went to a local record store and found all these old interview CDs with famous rock stars, Axl Rose and uh, John Bon Jovi and, and Eddie Van Halen and whatever, and I bought these interview CDs and I clipped out their answers and then I asked the questions and played the interview oh, and God. nobody knew. <laughs> you gotta do what you gotta do. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. <laughs> Did you ever think though, Ralph, back in the day that one day podcasting and online radio would be almost as important, if not more crucial for artists than actual radio? Well, I saw it happen gradually in a very organic way. So for about, I don't know exactly how many years, but let's just say it was like four years. I was hosting uh, this rock festival in um, Maryland called the M3 Rock Festival. And I wasn't necessarily hosting, but I was like a guest. Like they, they would invite us down to be a part of it. They'd give us free tickets to give away. Maybe I'd go on stage once or twice on one of the side stages. Like I was kind of hosting, but we would be in, for those that have never been backstage at a radio, like at a festival, there's an area they usually call like Radio Row, and it's all the local and and national or or web or whatever shows all lined up backstage, right? So a band plays their set, they get off stage, and then they start going down Radio Row to do those interviews, right? It happens at almost every festival, right? Mm -hmm. And when we started five years, you know, let's say the first year of the four or five years that I was hosting it, it was the big local rock station was the first uh, booth. And then the second booth was my show, the tour bus, because we were on 40 stations at the time or 50 stations. So it was like, oh my God, you know, we're, we're a big deal. So of course, they'll put you right next to us. So it was great. And then every year after, we were on more stations, but we got moved down a few more pegs. You know, so it'd be the local rock station. Then it was like some YouTube thing and then us. And then it was the local rock station, a YouTube thing, some web, uh, internet radio thing, a podcast, and then us. And then eventually on the fourth or fifth year, we were the last people in the row. <laughs> and I was like, okay, i I get the writing on the wall. Now this is not important anymore. You know? And when I first started doing both, I was so embarrassed of the podcast because at the time, six years ago to me, podcast was the connotation of some dude in his mom's basement. Mm -hmm. And I remember my first answer to podcasting is why would I do podcasting? Podcasting is for people that can't do radio. I'm doing radio. Mm -hmm. But then I would call, I called my podcast. The reason why it's called the SDR show and not the SDR podcast was that I was embarrassed to call it a podcast. <laughs> So that's why I call the SDR show. And then, um, 
eventually when that like last year of M3 hit and I was like, finally dawned on me that uh, podcasting is more important than radio is when I made that decision. So it, just, it took me a few years for it to sink in, but it definitely happened somewhat organically in my brain. Now, the Gas Digital Network has some amazing podcasts on here. I mean, you got Jamie Josta from Hate Breed. You got Rob Flynn from The Mighty Machine Head. Plus, you've got your show, yeah. Sex, Drugs, and Rock and Roll. But what do you want to see the Gas Digital Network achieve? It, what What is your number one goal other than to take over the world? <laughs> but to, <laughs> what, what, What's your number one goal with it, man? Well, I tell you, there's been a few metrics every year that we set. You know, like I want to do, I remember it was let's produce – a comedy special. So we did two, both of them hit number one at iTunes and that was great. And it's funny to me to say that I can be, I'm a, a EP two number one comedy special. So that was great. That was like an off network project. Both went very well. That was awesome. Then it was, um, the idea of having web exclusive, like exclusive only to the network, meaning that they're not free anywhere. They're just live on like a Netflix, you know, where you're only going to see it if you're subscribed. Right. Mm -hmm. So we added a couple of shows that are like that. They're only on the, uh, the subscription side. So you have like right now, there's one that's recapping the Rick and Morty season that's going on right now. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you're a fan and you want to watch that content, you have to be a gas digital subscriber. So now the new one that I'm was my metric for this year, which, you know, I think that I have to give myself a pass because, uh, everything kind of got screwed up with COVID, but the idea was to happen this year was our first scripted content, our first actual, like real, almost like a show show that has multiple cameras and is on lo multiple locations. And it could be scripted. It could be a reality show. It could be, um, you know, a comedy or, or, or sketch or whatever, but it's going to be with, you know, pre-planned production as opposed to every show on our network night right now, which is off the cuff interview style or comedy style, whatever, but they're all, you know, made up as you go. Maybe there's prep work, but there's not actual shot established EP people working on a show. So that is my goal for this year is to do at least one of those. And we have two or three that we are planning that are in the works right now. And I was hoping to start shooting one by September. So that's, that's the goal for this year. And then next year, I just, you know, as long as all the numbers of all the shows keep going up, that makes me happy. And I'd like to think that next year we would relaunch a, hopefully a successful app. We had an app for a while, but it wasn't working right. So we pulled it because I felt we were a content creation company that was being ju judged by our technology and we weren't a tech company. So I felt by removing the app, it would remove that bias. So we got rid of the app. But now that we have 20 something shows and so many people, it's just an added value is to have like a regular app that you can download on your phone that's cross platform. And also I'd like to think maybe a Roku app because it just, you know, like I said at the early part of this interview, you just want to be where people are looking. Mm -hmm. So if they're looking for, if they have, if they, if their choice platform is Roku or their choice platform is their, fire stick or whatever how great would it be to have the option to just put in our app and all your content is there it's just those things are crazy expensive and people don't realize how much of our budget goes to servers how much of our budget goes to hosting like it's crazy mm -hmm. it's so expensive so it's not like when you do if you're doing a podcast or you're on youtube they handle that but when you're doing private content on your own servers it is a goddamn fortune oh, yeah. to, to serve all that media. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just lucky to do what I do. And now, like I said earlier, I'm starting to do the video. I've got Restream, plus i got Zoom. Um, so you, you grow as you go, as I say. You know, it, it, it yeah. may take a while to get there, but eventually when you get there, it's going to be worth everything. I, just, I mean, that's the thing is that I've met with so many people that they want to do everything at once. Yeah. Like they want to be video, audio, multi-camera, paid platform, Patreon. I was like, dude, start with a podcast because <laughs> how do you expect people to pay for something they never even heard of? Yeah. What are you crazy? Yeah. And you may not even like doing it to begin with. So why right. spend all that money and you just do like maybe two episodes ago? Nah, n no. <laughs> yeah. We, we were working with this major, major, uh, uh, guitarist, uh, recently. And, I love the guy. I think he's awesome. But 
hit, we've been talking about him doing a podcast forever. He was super excited, but it's been six months and he hasn't delivered the first episodes. I keep getting, I keep hearing from his people. He's working on it. He's working on it, blah, blah, blah. But to me, if it took you six months to deliver the <laughs> first episode, I don't want to have to be making people wait for the second episode. So how are we going to do this? So I just kind of stop replying because yeah. be, you know, you have to, you have to want to do it. And Rob Flynn's a great example of that. Cause in the beginning he wasn't that into it. And then the um, COVID, it gave him his, his direct contact to the fan base. And he called me one day and he's like, God damn it. I fucking love doing this show now. <laughs> like it changed him so much. He oh, was yeah. so into it. Where, like, if you listen to his shows, go back because all of them are on YouTube. You go back to the first five or six and then listen to one recently. His whole attitude changed. He fell in love with doing it. Oh yeah. And, and once you get that itch, man, it's, it's the best drug ever. I cannot explain it to people unless you love to do this. I mean, if you go back and listen to my old podcast from back in the day from like, 2010, 11, you know, I sound like Chris Farley in that Saturday Night Live skit when he's <laughs> talking to Paul McCartney. You know that you were in the Beatles? I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah that's great. That's, that, great. that's how I, I was like, oh my God, I, I'm an idiot. But now I look back, it's like, just like you said, you make your bullets, your, your points, and, and you research. I cannot oh. stress that enough, man. That's the nail right there on the head is yeah. you research. I mean, it's that fucking simple, folks. But, uh, yeah, it's also funny. I tell people you're going to hate your first 10 episodes anyway. So just get started. <laughs> oh yeah. I had my first two years, dude. <laughs> it's like, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's no reason then it's fine. It's understandable, yeah. you know, like, but if you don't stick with it, you're not going to get better. Yep. If you think you're going to have, you know, Joe Rogan numbers, no, uh, within no. a year, you know, it's not going to happen. It's, not, it's just not like we had, we did shows with major celebrities that never got more than, you know, maybe eight, 10, 20,000 listeners. And they got so pissed off. I'm like, no dude, it takes a while. Yeah. It's not going to happen overnight. And he's like, no, but I'm, I'm me. I was like, I get it. But there's a, there's a million podcasts. So it takes a while. And a couple of these guys, they stopped doing the shows because they got, uh, you know, deflated that they, their numbers didn't leap off the page immediately. So like, if it's not happening for a, a major celebrity to get millions of fans right away, why are they listening to me? It's going to take a while. Yeah, and it's hard to do it just yourself. It's like, hey, help share. Then, you know, people will respond to you like that if you're that, that big of a person. You know what I'm saying? If you're that big, yeah. share, and you'll be surprised because that's that's what I'm waiting on. I try, I share, I share, I share. But Facebook, man, and, and YouTube, that you can only do so much. And you just yeah. ride and, you yeah. know, let everything go. You've written several columns for Metal Edge magazine. How, how was working with those folks and doing your columns, man, at the time? You know what? It was really fun. You know, it was a great time. Um, I've written columns here and there. There was one I did for two years for Social Underground, for Metal Edge. Uh, when Metal Edge I was doing those, it was, I mean, I don't even know how many years Metal Edge has not been around, but it was when I was doing my radio show. It was a great tie-in. So they would sponsor a segment on my radio show, and I would write uh, an article for the magazine. So we did, I think I probably did eight or 10 of them over the years. And it was like really more of a perspective of mine of maybe I hosted a festival. Maybe there was a band I interviewed. Maybe, you know, uh, I went to a, a, a certain, um, like a kiss convention or something. And I'd write it from a fan perspective of what I got to do that, that, that thing. And I really enjoyed it, you know, and it's funny because Paul Gargano, who was the, you know, Mr. Metal Edge for a long time. Him and I became very good friends over the years because uh, I used to, I hosted this uh, thing called Chip Rock and we became very friendly on Chip Rock and um, I hosted that for 10 years and he looks a lot like me and I look a lot like him. <laughs> so it ended up, the joke always now is that they call him West Coast Ralph and me East Coast Paul. <laughs> That's great. I know that you had a lot of music growing up, Ralph. I know. But did you just have that one go-to album or song, man, that kept leading you back to it? You, even today, do you still find yourself going back to that one album or song that uh, gave you inspiration still to this day or just let you you know, get away for a while? Well, I'll tell you, it's funny. is that I, I say this a lot in my life, that I'm not a superlative person. I have a very hard time picking a favorite anything, from color to band to food whatever. I've never been that way. There's only, first of all, there's only two, maybe three, I know for sure two artists whom I ever waited in line 
to get their new album the day it came out, right? Mm -hmm. And it's Queensryche and Whitesnake, right? Mm -hmm. um, those two, when, when Queensryche's Empire came out and when Whitesnake's um, uh, Sailing Ships, that album, oh, I can't think of the name of the title right now, but the one after the 1987 one, um, those two I waited in line to buy, right? But in, I forget what you're gonna say, it was probably 88, 89, somewhere around there when Operation Mind Crime was out um, from Queensryche. I was driving home from New Jersey from a girl's house that I was in love with. It was like midnight. I was getting in the car. And just to get in the car, the DJ on the radio station said, this is the album of the year, you know, whatever year, I think it's 88, it came out. And we are just going to play it from start to finish because this was a college radio station and they can get away with that, WSOU in New Jersey. And I just happened to come in the, to the vehicle when they gave their spiel about how great this album was, I had not heard of Queen's Rock at that time, you know? So I just listened and I listened to the album the whole way home. You know, the 40 minutes I was in the car, I was getting the signal for most of that ride. And I fell in love with that record. I went out the next day and bought it. And Queen's Rock became one of my favorite bands of all time. So I would say Operation Mind Crime is that album for me that I could listen to start to finish almost any day of the week. Do you have anybody on your bucket list, maybe two, that you want to get on Sex, Drugs, and Rock and Roll Show, man? For sure. I mean, Axl Rose, number one, uh, would love to get him on. You know, had a lot of the other members of Guns on my old radio show had Slash on and Duff on and Matt Sorum on and, and uh, never got Izzy on. But, you know, had um, even uh, Steven Adler on. Had, uh, you know, almost every guy but Axl. So Axl is a holy grail get. Um for the drugs stories, Charlie Sheen would <laughs> yeah. be a fucking great get to have, yeah. right? <laughs> I used to say Russell Brand, but because he seems too hippy dippy self help now, I've kind of lost interest. Yeah. You know, but I would say for sure one and two would be Axel Rose and Charlie Sheen. God, that Charlie Sheen interview would be just drop dead. You know what I mean? It's like plus him oh and I, God. him and I are wiener cousins. We what do they call that? You know, we we both had sex with the same girl once, like not at the same time, obviously, but uh, about two or three years apart. About fifteen years ago, I found out the girl I was dating was dating him. <laughs> oh, that's a conversation waiting to happen. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Ralph, how can folks stay in touch with you? Buy your book, the Gas Diesel Network, all this stuff, man, or even just to reach out to you to get some advice or on this. How can they do that? Sure. I, I always say DM me people. I try to get through them at least once a week. I sit down and go through all my DMs. Um, at I am Ralph Sutton and also I am Ralph Sutton .com. Uh, I am Ralph Sutton will take you to everything me. Um, it's easy to find every all my links there, but it's at the SDR show is my other and at gas digital or gas digital network.com uh, is the easiest way. But, you know, if you just go to my Instagram, which I'm probably the most active on is at I am Ralph Sutton. And there there's a links page right on my Instagram that can take you to buy my book, take you to my health and wellness show, good sugar podcast, take you to the SDR show, take you to gas digital. It's all right there on, on uh, at I am Ralph Sutton. And Ralph, before I let you go, I ask everybody to do this. Would you care to do me a promo for my show? Yeah. What is up, everybody? This is Ralph Sutton. You know me from the SDR show and the Good Sugar Podcast. Right now, you're listening to my boy. It's Bob's Mayhem Hour. Check your pants at the door. Everybody stick around. Check out our Facebook page. It has our podcast link, YouTube link. And you definitely want to subscribe to our YouTube link because we've got some giveaways coming up. Check that out. we got tickets to Ace Fraley and Alice Cooper Tour that's coming up. And you definitely want to do that. So, Ralph, man, thank you so much for doing the interview. And uh, I appreciate it. No, we just had Ace Freely and Alice Cooper on SDR recently. Uh, Ace came in the studio. Alice, we did uh, through Zoom. Uh, the Alice one was, was, they both were great interviews, but Alice was something about him, man. I've interviewed him a few times over the years, and he's just one of those dudes that is just incredible to talk to. He told a story about the first time he smoked pot. <laughs> he was 14 years old, and he smoked with Jimi Hendrix. Oh, wow. Wow. I like to hear that story for sure. See, that's a, I'd, I'd love to have these guys on my podcast. I'm trying. But, uh, hey, goals, goals, goals. That's all I can say. Like, girls, girls, girls. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thanks, Ralph. Thank you, buddy. You're listening.
listening to Bods Mayhem Hour. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram.